and a whole crew um, of former Democrats left the Democratic Party and they actually formed the Progressive Party in Barrie um, last night. So they had like a dozen people come out to do that and they're like gearing up to run town meeting day candidates. So, you know, all these little things that we hear and we're excited about, you know, it's having an impact. And, you know, I think one of the thing, one of the reasons that was possible is because they see like the great work we're doing um, with these state rep candidates and Tanya and like Emma's win this past March. And they're like, oh, it's actually possible for us to you know, to lead the Democratic Party and form an alternative and like actually win elections. So that's what we're doing here. So really exciting. So yeah, we're gonna give each candidate a couple minutes to just talk about why they're running, introduce themselves to you if you haven't met them already. And then we're going to launch into a very brief uh, Canvas training. And then we're going to go um, and anyone who's able or interested, um, we have turfs cut and we're gonna have people go out and knock some doors to um, go encourage likely progressive voters to go vote for the progressive candidates. So I'll turn it over to Misa. Hi, uh, you say my name, Misa Aloisi. Um, so I am a um, queer parent of two small children, a 10 year old and a seven year old, um, and a small business owner. And that, that um, person, that type of person, is woefully underrepresented in the house. So that's primarily why I'm running. Um, I am, I, I uh, started my architecture practice 11 years ago to make services affordable and approachable to homeowners. Um, and and um, that has been, that has been a really good thing. Every day I kind of go into people's homes and I ask, what do you need and how can I help? And then I look at, I negotiate with, with spouses sometimes or businesses on budget, timeline, um, and quality. So I think those that skill set that I've used over 20 plus years in the architecture profession is really transferable into this house position. Um, so I'm excited to bring that skill set to the house. Um, and the way also which I run my practice is really kind of inviting multiple people to the table and getting compromise um, and then working through a solution, um, which I think is, is at its all-time peak of <laughs> difficulty right now. Um, so that's why I'm also a progressive Democrat. Um, I want to actively show that I am representing two, at least two uh, parties, that I'm not solely just one party or the other. Um, I, and it also is part of who I am. I am a person that contains multiplicities. I am a woman, but my children call me Papa. So I, I bridge many categories just in that alone. Um, so I'm excited to um, continue doing kind of consumer protection and fighting for um, middle low class workers in Vermont, in Burlington. So thank you for coming out and um, representing me on the doors. <laughs> So hi, for people who don't know me, I'm Larry Lewak. I've been involved with the Progressive Party from day one. I was one of the founding co-organizers of the Vermont Progressive Party back in the day, in the 1980s. And um, I, this is my first time out running for legislature in this South End district, South End and Hill section. Um, but uh, ironically, 40 years ago, um, or almost 40 years ago, I ran for the legislature twice in two different cycles when we lived in Winooski. And the first time out, I got smoked. But the second time, I came within 36 votes of winning the Democratic primary. And then, 40 years ago, as today, my number one issue and reason for running is tax reform. Um, and I'm going to sound a lot like Zuckerman did in his campaign commercial that I heard yesterday. I, I feel like the way that we pay for schools in Vermont, uh, that the whole consensus for how we do that has come to a crashing halt. There's really no one wants to keep doing it the way we've been doing it, which is to say, basing um, the amount of education tax that you pay based on the uh, property assessed property value of your primary residence. So instead, I'd like to move that away from that primary residence taxation and more base it on um, income taxes, ability to pay, and that's something that is resonating as I talk out 
in the neighborhoods, talk with people on the doors. People are very interested to hear about more about that. Um, I, some people I mentioned the wealth tax, which passed the I think passed the House this year and didn't get through to, uh, taken up in the Senate. And I also uh, the only candidate of the four was focused on um, tenant issues, particularly trying to get our just cause eviction um, considered and passed in the legislature. Um, and also uh, my third issue. Uh, which I don't think anyone else is talking about either, is working for paid uh, universal um, paid family medical leave, um, which again um, was taken up by the legislature and um, promoted but didn't make it to cross the finish line. We have 70,000 Vermonters who were um, leaving work early or, or uh, have had to leave their jobs to take care of a loved one at home. And I feel like um, almost every other advanced industrial country provides a baseline income for people who are doing that blessed work because frankly no one else is going to do it, but they, they, they shouldn't have to worry about how they're going to pay their rent um, when, they're doing, when they're taking care of a loved one. So um, I'm running in the Democratic primary. I've already been, been endorsed by the progressive group in, in the district, um, nominated and endorsed by progressives. So if I win the Democratic primary, I would run as a D slash D and caucus with the progressives and the Democrats. Um, I, uh, it's a very competitive race. We have, uh, it's a two-member district and we have four people running. One of them is an incumbent, Tiff Bloomley, who uh, I'm pretty confident she's going to get reelected. She's done a great job and she happens to be a very uh, progressive Democrat. Um, then, so that really comes down to me and two other people competing for that one other seat. Um, and uh, all four of us are uh, you know, similarly politically inclined. There's not a lot of daylight between our positions. Um, on the spectrum, but I feel like with my experience, particularly in um, working with members of the legislature to get bills passed, um, particularly a bill in 2009 that benefited uh, people in the prison system who had serious mental illness, that uh, created some, some new entitlement to services and prevented them from being locked up in segregation for weeks at a time just because they were deeply psychotic. Um, that's something I'm particularly proud of, and, and so I spend a lot of time in the State House as an advocate. I know how to get things done there, and I feel like that's a good selling point for me. So I'll stop there. Thank you for caucus. For, for I'm Senator Tanya Vyhovsky and I'm running for re-election. Um, I grew up in a single parent working class home in Vermont. I'm a clinical social worker and I'm one of two renters in the Senate. And so I think that what really drives me to continue running is the fact that representation matters. It's been incredibly difficult in my time in the State House to pass renter protections, to get even just cause eviction charter changes through because we have a lot of landlords and very few people who are directly impacted by struggling to afford to live here and by renting and not being able to own a home. I moved back from college and quickly found that I couldn't afford to own a home here and watched my dreams of, of really settling down here kind of float away. And so instead of leaving, like so many of my generation is doing, I decided to run for office and try to make it better. Um, and I am really hoping that we are gonna bring more of our progressive champions into the house and into hopefully some Senate seats across the state, because I am the current, so I caucus with the Democrats in the Senate, um, but I am currently the only P slash D um, Senator. And sometimes that means I am a lonely no vote or a lonely advocate for something. And I support paid family leave and I support you know tenant protection and, and progressive taxation and I need allies. And so I'm not here just to ask people to vote for me and get out and canvas for me, but I'm here to ask people to vote for my colleagues that you've heard from and canvas for them as well, because I can't do it alone. Um, and this past session has been particularly difficult as we hear immense amount of rhetoric around property taxes and public safety and what all of those conversations are lacking in the State House a lot of the time is the real human impact and the need for real community investment if we're gonna build a Vermont where everyone can actually thrive. Incarcerating more people is not gonna make us safer or healthier. We know that because you know if, if that was gonna work, the United States would be the fifth safest country in the world because we incarcerate the fifth highest number of people, but we're not. In fact, we fall in the bottom one third of safest countries in the world. We've gotta think differently. We've gotta think transformatively. We are at a real inflection point with multiple crises facing us. A housing crisis, an opioid crisis, a climate crisis, 
flooding all over the state, and we are not going to solve these problems thinking the same way we've always thought, doing the same things we've always done, or recycling things that we've done in the past to try and see if this time they're going to work. We're going to do it by coming together and bringing the voices of those most impacted to the table to help us solve those issues. As a clinical social worker, when I'm not in the state house, what I've come to know is those of us that are closest to the problem often know exactly what we need to solve the problem but have the least access to power. And so I've made it a commitment both to bring my own stories into those spaces as well as to make sure that we are hearing from the people that are directly impacted. When we're talking about just cause eviction, it's not enough to hear from the housing commissioner or the Burlington Housing Authority. We need to hear about people who've been no cause evicted. You know, when we're talking about criminal justice reform, it's not enough to hear from the commissioner of DOC. We need to hear from people who have been incarcerated. And that has been a mission of mine to make sure that my election has opened the doors for people who never saw themselves in positions of power because that was my story. When someone first told me to run, long before I actually did, I laughed at them because I didn't see myself represented. And then it was actually Senator Sanders who convinced me that the fact that I didn't see myself represented was why I had to run, not a reason not to. And so that is why I am running for re-election. I do have a contested primary. Um, it is a difficult primary. I'm running against someone who has a fair amount of name recognition and a lot of money that's coming from corporate developers and corporate landlords. Um, so I need your help. And I thank you all for being here and for helping me and all of my allies as we try to get across the finish line in this last like nine days. So thank you. All right. Uh, well, I'm uh, David Zuckerman. For those that don't know me, I think I know just about everybody here from CSA members to many longtime political allies and friends and activists and so forth. Um, I'm going to sort of make a small joke here, which is that in my debates this week, my opponent uh, asked me about sort of when would I be ready to get out of the way for people that might uh, reflect different demographics than the demographics that I uh, appear to represent. And as I listen to Senator Vyhovsky speak, I think, you know, when an opponent runs against me who is that articulate, on these incredibly important issues and who has brought not only their time and their energy, but the different people that Senator Vyhovsky just talked about into the process, that that is the kind of person that I would maybe get out of the way for uh, when that's the question. The main question I got from my opponent was about that, as opposed to housing, opposed to criminal justice reform, opposed to property tax reform, as Larry spoke about as well. And um, it was great to hear you speaking, but I also hadn't seen Erica in so long. I was whispering in the back, so I apologize. But um, the, the friend thing. Um, but I, too, I am opposed in a primary. I'm the only statewide official who is opposed. Um, many of you recognize that um, sometimes there's some party dynamics in Burlington and Winooski <laughs> where, uh, regardless of one's views on the issues, Regardless of people think you do a good job, regardless of whether they agree with you on pretty much everything, because of party labels and party politics, sometimes they get behind another candidate. And um, it's a difficult challenge when I look at what people are actually facing, what the energy that is being used in this race and the money that's being used in this race could be used for to work towards addressing so many of those challenges that we all are in common unity about, um, it kind of blows my mind. It really does that people are so partisan um, from a party that claims to be a big tech party. I mean, it's kind of like upside down world in another way that we think of someone else being an upside down world on a much bigger scale. <laughs> and so um, I am thankful for some of the folks in this room who have literally been with me in different permutations and combinations for as many as 20 odd years. Uh, you know, I've represented you for over 20 years from a ward, you know, district race uh, all the way through the Senate and then now as Lieutenant Governor. And um, I feel incredibly honored. Uh, but also that work, that time, that effort, hopefully will also help me statewide as I think I have maybe a little more name recognition, a little more face-to-face -face, uh, time with folks. 
But, you know, one of the things that we have is that common bond that the people and our planet are more important than any partisanship or any nitpicky kind of that happens. Because it's sort of a privilege, frankly, to have time to do this stuff while people are struggling to put food on their table, struggling to keep a roof over their head because of property taxes or lack of affordable housing. Because yes, while the house passed, it was actually an income tax, but it was a high-end income tax to put money into affordable housing. There are enough people in the Senate and a governor who killed that from the get-go, including the chair of the Economic Development Committee in the Senate, who is one of the senators that's endorsed my opponent. Because for some reason, people that make over $500,000 can't afford a, a little bit more so that people can afford a, a house or a roof over their head. You know, I've been talking with people all over the state pointing out that one third of the counties, second homes, pay a lower tax rate than primary residences. As far as property tax reform, that's certainly one of the adjustments. Um, I would argue anybody that can afford a second home can afford to help other people have a first. And, you know, those are the kinds of issues that need more voices in the state house. And so seeing these great candidates and senator who are going to espouse those kinds of ideas is very exciting to me. And um, I hope, you know, August 13th, uh, we'll get some great results. But we can't win on hope. Uh, we win by outworking and out debating and out presenting the real issues that are out there affecting people. And so the candidates are doing that day in and day out. And those of you who are helping either with as the word goes, treasure, which is also just your basic money, um, is very helpful. And those of you that are going out and you're gonna do leafleting and some door knocking, or maybe you're helping put up lawn signs, or maybe you're making phone calls, or maybe you're doing data entry, all of those pieces are the work that has gotten so many progressives into office over the years. And um, so I thank you for that. Uh, and I am sorry that it is so hot for both <laughs> my crew on the farm and the days that we're outside in the heat, but also, you know, door knocking is not easy. So take care of yourselves. But if you've got it in you to go do a route or do something, whether it's today or tomorrow or the next day, please do, because um, we're in the home stretch. And we've got some real, real opportunities here that are pretty exciting. So thank you. Do you want any quick Q&As with any of us if they want to come up? Does anybody have any questions for these amazing people? We're amazingly ahead of time, so. <laughs> yeah. And if not, that's okay. A lot of you know a lot of us already, and you can always see that. Yes, please. Yeah, um, maybe better for the time yet, yeah, but in the state, Senate, and House right now, or statewide, what policies are being worked on now for housing, especially, um, you know, housing, cost of housing that you mentioned that we're experiencing in Burlington and across the state? Okay, in some ways in this minute, not a lot, because everyone's out campaigning. Yeah. But in campaign mode, you're sort of working on these ideas. So one of the ways I see it is, when I'm out there talking about making it so second homeowners at least pay as much as primary residents, if not actually a higher rate, um, and maybe a progressively higher rate. Very few people have talked about how you could have a property tax rate of this for the first X dollars of a value of a home, and you could have a higher rate for the next, you know, just like a progressive income tax, why not? If we talk about these ideas, and then we win, that says to the political Zeitgeist, oh, maybe people are actually supportive of that, even though they should know that they are. So that's one of many, but there's, yeah. Yeah, one of the things we did in the last biennium that I think is really important and I hope to be able to act on in January was actually, so Vermont has a really blunt ta property tax mechanism in that we have two categories, homestead and non-homestead. Um, there are places that have much more progressive property taxation systems like Hawaii where they have 12 categories of taxation so they're much better able to fine tune who's paying what. And so we actually tasked um, the tax commission last year in a bill to bring us back additional categories so that we can expand our property tax categories to more fine tune in those costs to do exactly what David's talking about so that we are able to more fine tune who is paying what. And certainly my hope is to go in and really look at, you know, if you're a homeowner 
you're you know paying a certain rate on certain amounts whereas if you have three vacant homes that you visit one for skiing and one on the lake maybe that taxation rate looks different versus if you're running an airbnb versus so really trying to think how we more fine-tune in our property taxation system is one thing that we worked on i've also been working really closely with legislators in maine california and the city council in vienna austria um, so Vienna has one of the most robust social housing programs um, in the world, and Maine and California legislators have both introduced um, policy around social housing. So I've been trying to, over the last year, take that information and collate it into something I can introduce in January that would be Vermont's, like, right-sized for Vermont to really look towards social housing, which really creates organic, multi-generational, multi-income communities, which is what we know we need and is the healthiest for both affordability and community safety. And so I've been really trying to think outside the box of what we've kind of always done and really look to introduce transformative ways of creating communities that are affordable for everyone. And you can look up actually New York Times did a very big expose on the Vienna housing model now probably three or four years ago. But it's a phenomenal kind of description of the, the federal and sort of local investment to build this this housing. Yeah. Other questions for anyone else? I mean, another housing thing that's been talked about, and Anthony Kalina really was a, a drum beater on this, is the idea that we are income sensitized for those that make under about 128,000 a year, which is give or take 65, 70% of our population. And in many ways, it was one of the most progressive property tax laws in the country when it initially passed in 1997, the first year I was in the legislature. Um, Oddly enough, I voted no because it wasn't progressive enough. Um, but uh, it sometimes wins me some votes with Republicans. I'm like, oh, I actually voted against Act 60, which then I point out it was for a completely different reason. But, um, but right now, because of how property values have changed and taxes have changed over time, those folks who do make at the high end of the spectrum, over 400, over 300, um, they p typically pay a lower percentage of their income towards property taxes because their incomes are commensurately so much higher relative to their property values, which are higher. And so just changing it to everybody being adjusted to an income rate would do about a 30 to $40 million tax relief for working people uh, and additional income to the system from uh, the wealthiest. And the one other thing, sorry, property taxes are a big one, is that Unlike most other states, and this is an important point for everyone at the doors too, in most states, the mental health and human services portion of what happens in schools is paid for by general fund and other resources through the agencies of human resources, agencies of human services. And in Vermont, that's actually primarily on the property tax. And during the Scott administration, there's been about a $60 million increase in social services in just the last four or five years because of additional mental health counselors and others in our schools. And he says no new taxes, so instead of paying for it out of human services where you'd have to figure out how to find the money and pay for it, they've allowed it to be on the schools, which is one of the huge drivers of the ed costs going up that everyone's so frustrated by. So as he wags his finger at the legislature, which is already a misnomer that they raise the taxes, um, he's really pushing off the responsibility of managing government in a way that actually does it like every other state. So when they say, we spend so much more per pupil than other states, they're actually comparing apples to oranges because in those other states, their ed fund spending doesn't include that huge, and it's more than 60 million. That's the additional of the last four years. So happy to talk more about that with anybody for, for door work as well. Sorry. And you got to go. Happily. Baby shower. Yeah, know. All good. Prior yep. <laughs> Just it's shake hands, not babies. Yes. Right? Just remember that part. <laughs> You're still being recorded. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate this last little push because campaigns. Not a single person ever. Thanks a lot of people. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're doing awesome. <laughs> Any other last questions for anybody? Do you have some uh, topics of what's happening you want to talk about? Well, yeah, so, yeah, if there are no other questions, we'll launch into the kind of canvas portion of the meet and greet.
Um, so we're just going to do a quick kind of training, and then for <coughs> folks who are able and willing to go knock doors, we have turfs cut and we have campaign materials. The whole idea of this exercise is that we're in get out the vote mode. We pulled lists, basically people who have been supporters of progressive candidates, um, like David, Emma, people like that in the past. So like identify people who we know support progressives, people have donated, people have done things with the progressive party explicitly. So there should be fairly friendly conversations, not too, not too challenging. Shouldn't get too many Republicans, although sometimes there are always weird things in the list. Um, but yeah, let me ask, like how many people have knocked doors for any candidate before? Cool, so that's like pretty much everyone. So this should be pretty easy then. Um, so yeah, we have a, a script right here. This is a little different. Um, we're calling this kind of a soft canvas. So this is like halfway between, um, this is, yeah, you can pass that around. It's like halfway between a, like a deep canvas, like full door knocking conversation and just a lit drop. So the whole idea is that we're doing just a very quick conversations. Um, you know, oftentimes, like if you're going out with a candidate or um, trying to move voters, you know, you're engaging much more like asking them questions, um, really pushing kind of the narrative and like trying to like move them to be supportive. These are more like quick get out the vote conversations. Um, we're not really trying to go deep into conversation with them. Um, although that could certainly happen and we're not discouraging that either. Um, feel free to have conversations. But the idea is we're just giving them a little bit of information um, and then handing them campaign materials for the four candidates um, or the three candidates that, that will be in the district that you have. Um, yeah, let me, let me actually look at myself so I can look at it. <laughs> We have a, yeah, so basically the script is, um, Adam, you want to you wanna come practice with me? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm knocking on your door, so I'm going to go knock, knock, knock. Hello. Hey, how's it going? My name's Josh. I'm a volunteer with the Vermont Progressive Party. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing all right. How are you? Nice. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm doing good. We're just out knocking on doors because the primary election is coming up um, on August 13th, just like a week and a half. Um, we want to make sure that you have a plan to vote. Um, have you heard about the election? Are you paying attention? No, I didn't know there was an election on, in August. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the primary. All three major parties, uh, Democrat, Republican, um, and progressive all vote on August 13th for the primary. So this is your opportunity to kind of decide um, what candidates for the statewide level um, you're going to be voting in. And your district is actually one of the most competitive districts in the state um, for in the Democratic primary. Um, do you think you're planning on voting in the Democratic primary? I mean, I guess so. Am I going to get a ballot in the mail? No, so not this cycle. Um, they will mail ballots for the general election, but this cycle you have to actually go and vote in person. You can vote in City Hall um, right now, um, or you go and you vote at your polling place um, on the 13th. So that's your option. Um, and yeah, so you know, I'm out here encouraging folks to support um, a few different candidates. Um, so on the top of the ticket, we have Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, who's running for re-election, um, and then for state senate, we have Senator Tanya Bihovsky, who's also running for re-election. And then um, for state rep, uh, Missa Alosai, who's running um, as a first-time candidate um, for state rep. And yeah, all these folks, um, they're going to be a great team to tackle property tax fairness, um, the climate crisis, and addressing the housing crisis, because we do have a housing crisis, as I'm sure you know. Um, yeah, do you think you're supportive of these candidates? Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Well, here's some information. Thank you. Um, and yeah, we'll see you at the polls on August 13th. All right. Cool. <laughs> so, yeah, so pretty basic. Um, and you're going to get a lot of people saying there's an election this morning? <laughs> I mean, but hopefully not. But yeah, no, you will You will certainly get it's a lot. It's a lot. You will it's get, a lot. yeah. Can I offer two quick sure. things? Sure. One is I would add that they're not getting a bit about in the mail automatically. They can actually still go yeah. vote at their clerk any day. Mm -hmm. So from now until election day, if you're interested or you're not sure about your timing, just go to your clerk. 
you can town offices and you can get your ballot. You can either vote it there, or you can bring it home and do it when you have some time to research folks. So that's one other thing it's I would add. It's probably too late to request it by mail, get it in right. and be able to yeah. pull it back. That's right. So yeah, in Burlington, it's City Hall. So you can tell people, just go yeah, in, just go to City Hall, Hall and vote. Yep. Yeah. Also, um, I mean, I voted by mail, and I got this notice that if you don't um, mail in the primary ballots for the other parties, that's right. so we're encouraging it people count. to vote Democrat. Uh, if you don't send in the Prog and Republican ballots, then they won't count it. But in Burlington, right. you're getting a notice on that. Well, so they actually have to give you a notice and they have to let you cure it. We passed that law when I was in house government operations in 2021. So if you make a mistake like that, the city clerk, had, there is a requirement that they reach out to you and let you know that you made that mistake and allow you to cure it so your vote still can count. But giving but yeah. people the proper information that doesn't happen is important. Exactly. But it is not like before 2021, or I think it was 2022, because there was an election cycle where that vote just would automatically not count. There is now ballot curing for mistakes like that. Yeah, that was, that was just one little yeah. thing. I want to make sure people know, like, if you're going to be too busy on the 13th or you're not sure, go to your clerk. You can vote anytime. And like you said, ask them to mail it to you and mail it back is a different matter. You can actually get it to the clerk yes. and bring it home. Mm -hmm. Take two days and take it back. So it's not like you have to go in and know every answer mm -hmm. in the moment. That's all I'd say. And um, the other thing is that if you get a ballot and you can't get it back to City Hall, you can go on the 13th and vote it yourself. Bring it in. At your polling place. Does Burlington still have drop boxes? Yes. 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 So you can also take it to a drop box that is there. But you can secure it there 24-7. It's in front of the one in front of City Hall. There's, but, a, there's but one also public every works too. board will have a, a drop box. Mm, I don't know. I yeah, think they will have drop boxes a week before election day. Also, you like, can yeah, you have them around town. Day. Yeah, not necessarily at the polling place. So if it's we like, have one at four three. Okay. If you yeah. if you don't have a drop box in your board, but it's the thirteenth and you already voted, you could walk into the polling place and just give them right. your ballot. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you, you you talk to them and they make you go and put it through the. Oh, that's the access. Access. Well, Yeah, so places are different. The point is you can go to your polling place with yeah. your ballot and it will get counted. The mechanism, yes. whether you do it <laughs> or they do it, is a little bit less important. Yes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that was a big one. And I had one other thought. Oh, I did hear, you know, a fair amount of chuckling about the, no, I didn't realize it was an election. I want to make it really clear. There are those of us that pay attention, probably almost to the effect of being a little bit mentally ill, that there are elections happening and we're watching everything and we're watching the national news and we're watching the local news and we're blah, 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 blah. A lot of people, especially those we're fighting for, are working 60 hours a week. They're home and they're tired and they're doing the dishes and they're trying to feed their kid and they're just trying to get to bed. They're actually respectfully not paying or not that they do or don't want to pay attention, it's just not in their lens because there's so much going on. So I think it's really important to recognize that, that in fact, it is really true. A lot of people don't know. And so when you're knocking, when they say no, don't be surprised. And because and, sometimes surprise can come across as judgment as well. And so just be aware of that. Like, yeah, boy, it makes sense. Like the world's really busy, I get it. Like working to connect with people means acknowledging where they are. And that goes a really long way to them being receptive to the information you're giving or whatnot. So I would say that's the most common response I am giving on yeah. actually is that people had no idea that there is a primary right. election. They're like, yep, I'm voting in November. And like, okay, well, I'm going to need you to vote in August too. And having run the numbers, and these are a few days old now, but my team has is running the numbers for my Senate district, and ballot returns are down almost 60% from two years ago. So it's a tiny number of people that have returned ballots and voted. So this is this week leading up is critically important to get our people out. That's how we're going to win. Um, and so anything we can do, like we have many, I mean, the, my Senate district, I think we estimate it's about 47,000 voters, and as of the end of last week, um, there were about 2,100 ballots that had been returned, which means that there's still 45,000 voters out there for us to connect with and get out to vote. So go team. Yeah, and um, I have a technical question. I, I, well, actually, a different board. And I don't know the boundaries of this district, uh, Evans Old District. Where is the polling place nowadays? It's probably got multiple polling Yeah, it's multiple. Um, okay. So there's the 
Yes, and it just one of the important things is just Ward 3, so that would be yeah. uh, old Wheeler, Wheeler School, which is yeah, the Arts School Academy. Academy. And that got moved to the yeah. um, one community center, right? Yeah, so the one community center. Uh, 3 is Lawrence Barnes, 2 is Wheeler, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, but also in the new North End. So I don't know whether it's Hunt or the other. Oh, those are the ones that are across the street, the community Smith center. And Hunt. And, yeah. yeah, the community center. So there's multiple. And you can go online if we don't get it figured out. Yeah, your right. My Voter page is the best place to mm -hmm. figure out where your polling location is. So that's the Secretary of State's website. You have a My Voter page, and they'll tell you exactly where your voters are. What I'm thinking is, whatever, where, wherever I'm assigned to go, yes. it would be good if I knew what, what I was on the doorstep. Yeah. Didn't have to we can look that so up. Yeah. I have a map of all the polling places in Chittenden Central. It looks like the one for that district are going to be St. Mark's Youth Center mm -hmm. and Robert Miller Recreation Center. Would you say those again louder? St. Mark's Youth Center, Robert Miller Recreation Center, and then the Sustainability Academy. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in the end, whatever district you get, we can tell you specifically, exactly. because whatever streets you have will literally determine which yeah, of those places. Exactly. Exactly. We, and we can put those right on the charts for people. You can't yeah. vote where you regularly vote. Correct. Sure. It's not the choice. choice. You don't get to choose which one. You don't get one. a choice. Oh, that's oh, yeah. Yeah. Some states do. Yeah, I'm trying to. But uh, so that's a good question. And each of you, wherever you go, the three speeds you have, they can make sure to give you that specific detail. Any other questions? Are there any issues? We talked a bit about housing. You know, issues are really important, and particularly as candidates going into a little detail, they expect a lot more from us than they might expect from you. But one of the things you can always say is, you know, I don't know where David stands on that. But you know what? His email address is right here. And I know his team or he is more than willing to answer that question. So please send them an email or give them a call because they know more. Because if you say something that you don't know and it isn't what we each respectively believe in, then that can actually be a little bit troublesome. So it's OK to not know. You can also take down their contact information and Even get it to any one of the candidates right. and we can reach out directly. Yeah. I had no idea why property taxes were going up so high, and what you just told us was like opening up a Christmas present or something, because it's something we can talk about. We put out, I think it was an Instagram post or a different post very recently with a bit of an explanation it was, uh, about property taxes. But there are a lot so of people we can in get Burlington who don't do social media. No, I know, uh, but, but if you yeah. want a copy of that, Nick okay. can get that for you. And there's a multitude of reasons why property taxes oh, went up. So you know, the health care costs, the fact that they've been held sort of artificially low for three years because of the COVID money that is now gone. There's many conflict, like. It's like saying climate change is only fossil fuels. Right. 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 It's also politicians hiring. And it's also animal agriculture. Yeah, absolutely. It's common with lots of forms of agriculture. 18%. Other questions or thoughts? Cool. Well, I think these folks have a plan. Yes. <laughs> it's the usual suspects who have a plan. Right. Uh, so yeah, I think generally, uh, well, let, let me ask, so like, who's actually down to go door knock right now? Woo! <laughs> okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like eight, okay, cool. So who, is comfortable going on their own and who wants someone to pair up? Or do we want to do everyone pair up, pair up? I think pairing up. Pairing up, okay. So we'll do everyone pair, pair up. Okay. Um, so, and we're gonna try to break it down evenly between the districts. So we'll do um, basically like four and four, or two and two. Two and two, yeah, sorry. Two, two, and, two. and two, yeah. Um, and then we'll, we'll go hit doors. Which district do you do? So it's Mrs. District and Larry's District. So change your script to Larry. Yep, I have a different. So I have a different script. All of these, yeah. all of your bags have your routes loaded in them, yep. and the scripts and the literature. You're gonna walk them through how to use the lit routes. Yep. Yeah. So if so you are going, can we pair people off? And, yeah. So they can have it in their hand. Before we all head off, too, can we all grab a group photo? Yep. Good call. Cool. We're gonna take a group photo. All right, so everyone come over here and I will grab one.
you want candidates in the front? Yes, candidates in the front. What? We're coming to take a photo real quick. Oh, okay. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Yep. They gave me the bond the first time. I don't think you're married. I don't mind. No, well, uh, just for the picture. And I just washed my t-shirt. All right. Which one are we looking at first, folks? <laughs> <laughs> Just one of you first? Yeah. All right, I guess. Yeah, let's, you go okay. first. I go first, okay. One, two, three. Okay, cool. All right. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. <laughs>